Right, good afternoon everyone um, and welcome to the first of the, the technical lectures of this, uh, this series. So it's my pleasure to be uh, giving you the first lecture on extrusion, micro extrusion and die drawing. Um, just by way of introduction, my name's Adrian Kelly. I'm uh, an academic here at Bradford. I'm a reader in polymer engineering. Um, so I, I work in this area. I, I manage our extrusion activities um, and I'm uh, involved in lots of the research that you, you'll see around the, the uh, laboratories. Uh, and what I'm going to be talking about today is uh, essentially, I realize you're all from different backgrounds uh, and, and within one hour we're not going to be world experts in extrusion, so I'm going to try and give you a fairly high level overview of extrusion, what extrusion is, why it's used, why it's important, the key features of it, and how it relates to micro extrusion on the smaller scale. So we're going to be talking about single screw extrusion, twin screw extrusion, which is slightly different, a slightly different process, um, micro extrusion, and then we're going to be moving on to talking about die drawing, which is a separate process, which is an orientation process to improve the properties of materials. Um, I am going to start from, a, from quite a basic level because, as I understand it, um, you all come from different fields of, of engineering, different materials and different processes. So I'm just going to have a, a, a few slides just setting the scene really and giving a bit of a background as to what polymers are and why they're used generally. So polymers, as I'm sure most of you know, polymers are long molecular chains. They're materials consisting of, uh, of a high number of long molecular chains made up from small units called monomers. So synthesized typically from oil, but not necessarily, um, with molecular weights very high up to a million and above, up to maybe 10 to the 7 molecular weight. So polymers are these long chain molecules. And what does a plastic refer to as opposed to a polymer? Um, well, one definition of plastic is the type of deformation, permanent deformation. Um, but it also refers to um, what's really um, classed as a man-made material, which consists of a polymer with other additives, because um, most plastics that we use in, uh, in our daily life and within engineering applications consist of a polymer, but to make it usable, it, it contains lots of different additives as well. So it might be additives to improve its strength or its stability or its ease of processing. <coughs> so plastic normally refers to a man-made polymer plus other additives. So why are polymers used? So um, maybe some of you who don't work in the polymer field who aren't experts want to make some suggestions. Why, why are polymers so widely used in our everyday life and engineering. Can you think of any reasons? They're low cost, they're relatively low cost, yes. Any other reasons? The properties, yeah, that's an important one. They have a very wide range of properties which we can tailor. And one more really big reason why they're, they're used a lot. They're lightweight, but they're easy to manufacture in the molten form. They're easy to shape, so we can melt them and form them into shape, and that's, that's one of the key reasons, really. So I think we picked out all these. They're relatively low cost. They have a huge range of, of properties. So polymers can range from very soft, rubbery, or wax-like materials, uh, gels, to very, very hard engineering-type materials that can uh, compete with the properties of metals. Um, and we can tailor these properties, obviously, by choosing the type of polymer to use. Um, we can blend different polymers together to get benefits from, from different types of polymeric properties. And we can add other materials to form composites. So we can improve the properties of, of polymeric materials by adding fibrous materials or nanofillers to get some uh, beneficial um, property. And very importantly as well, they're easy to form into complex shapes in the molten state. That's one of the real benefits of polymers compared to other materials such as metals. Um, metals are typically machined into shape, formed into shape, which takes a lot more energy, whereas polymers, we can heat them up, take them past their uh, softening point or melting point, and form them into shapes. So we can form very, very complex shapes from polymers, and I'm sure I mean, most of you are sat on laptops and looking at phones, so you can see the, 
the intricate nature of the, the shapes that's formed using polymers. Uh, and there's a wide range of processes that can be used with, with polymeric materials to form different types of products, different geometries of products. So this is just the last slide of the, the kind of introduction section, and this just explains um, one thing about polymers which is really important, which makes them very, very usable, and that's their viscosity, their resistance to flow. And we've got a lot, we're, we're covering um, rheology, flow behaviour tomorrow. That's going to be another one of the lectures tomorrow, which myself and uh, Dr. Tim Goff are presenting. Um, but just, to, just by way of introduction, the viscosity of a material is, is its resistance to flow. Okay, and a Newtonian material has this uh, rate-independent flow behaviour. So it doesn't matter how fast we make the material flow, its viscosity doesn't change. The good thing about polymers, because of the way polymers are made up of uh, a distribution of lots of different chains of different molecular weights, polymers like, a, if you imagine, a big plate of spaghetti all kind of tangled up together. Because of that nature, the faster we push polymers, the faster we make them flow, those entanglements start to break um, the viscosity drops. We get what's called a shear thinning or pseudoplastic behavior. And this is really beneficial for us to be able to process polymers, to be able to force them in their molten form into complicated shapes. So this shear thinning behavior whereby the faster we push them, the viscosity gets lower and lower, so they become effectively easier to form into shapes is one of the reasons polymers are used. So this is a graph showing viscosity against shear rate. And I won't say any more about that because, as I say, we've got a, a full lecture on rheology and how we characterise rheology tomorrow. So on to extrusion, um, which is the main focus of the topic today. So what does extrusion mean? The definition of extrusion is really forming something into a shape by pushing it through a die. So this is just a very simple example of, of something, a, a billet, which has been pushed through, of a soft material, which has been pushed through a shape uh, a die of a certain shape to form that shape. So very simply put, it's just a process of forming something by, by pushing it through a die. And it doesn't just apply to polymeric materials, it applies to foods. Obviously, you think of pasta, again, of dried pasta, spaghetti or penne or something like that. It's formed by extrusion. It's forced uh, through a die to form a particular shape. Lots of foodstuffs as well, lots of uh, snacks, these kind of corn snacks and lots of breakfast cereals are formed by extrusion as well. But what we're typically going to be concerned about today is, is obviously polymer extrusion. It's also used for very important processes as well, like um, Play-Doh, forming shapes from Play-Doh, which is where children can push this soft material through to form different shapes. So in this case, we form the hair of these people, which, which, which our kids can then play with and cut and style into lots of different shapes. And the history of extrusion, it goes back hundreds of years in fact, it goes back many centuries. People were using extrusion, were using this very basic process to form um, pastas and clay pipes and tubes hundreds of years ago. Um, lead pipes um, in the um, 1790s. But really, people started to use it for polymers um, in 1850s, so we're still going back 160, 170 years. The first screw extruder was um, developed in, in 1879. But really the big development in extrusion was with the, the advent of thermoplastic materials in the 1930s. So that's when the first true thermoplastic extruder, as we know it, was developed, and the first twin screw extruder. So it's not, uh, it's not a new technology. It's been around for, for many decades, but obviously there's been advances in the technology since then. So extrusion, um, as we've seen, forming a shape by pushing it through a die. But essentially, extrusion, plastics extrusion, polymer extrusion is the continuous ma manufacture of a product which has a constant cross-section. So anything that can be made continuously can be produced by extrusion. So it can't produce the very complex shape of the cases of your laptops and the electronics, but to produce pipes and tubing and cable coating and sheets and fibers, filament, even quite complex shapes, as long as that shape remains a constant cross-section, it can be produced by extrusion. It's a very important process because as well as being a manufacturing process in its own right, extrusion is the starting point for many other polymer processes. 
So lots of the other processes you'll, you'll see something out of in the next few days, such as injection molding and micro molding, have an extruder screw at the heart of them. So the, the part of the machine that takes the polymer, melts it, is the same as, as, as what's in the extruder. So it forms the basis of lots of different types of polymer processing equipment. So typical products that are made by extrusion include, well, as you can see in these images, tubes and pipes, um, sheet and film. A lot of the uh, packaging materials that our food comes in is extruded. Um, profile is this, this sort of shape here. This is a window profile. So this is a PVC window frame that if you cut it up and cross-section it, looks like this in cross-section. Cable coating, obviously a very big area. There's a huge amount of wire and cables um, around. So the extruder itself, this is the basic uh, diagram that, that shows what is inside the extruder and what the extrusion process is. And it's pretty simple, um, essentially. What we've got is uh, a rotating screw inside a heated barrel. That's at the, the heart of the extruder. It's an Archimedean screw which rotates inside a heated barrel. So our polymer drops down here in this hopper. It's fed into the extruder via hopper. Um, it's gradually melted along the length of the screw. It, it's forced through a die to form its shape. And then depending on the type of product, um, what we do after that, we need to cool it and, and keep maintain it in that shape. So we might go through a calibrator, a water bath. We might wind it up onto a system. We might cut it into lengths. But we do something with the, the polymer post-process. So essentially, the, the extrusion process has different steps. The first step is to melt the polymer. So we have a melting that occurs somewhere in the barrel there. We have the forming, which happens as the polymer goes through the die and then through the calibrator. And then the solidification as it returns to its solid state. Hopefully, it maintains its geometry, its integrity, its shape, and its properties. Uh, I'll come to that in a minute. It's a good question, but we, we, do, we do come to that because we'll look at the different parts of the process in a little bit more detail in a minute. So, um, so we'll, we'll go through these different stages of the process. We'll look at the start, the feeding, and, and the solids conveying. We'll look at the melting region. We'll look at the dye. And then we'll look at a few different applications, um, uh, and then we'll, we'll move on to twin screw extrusion. So the, the feeding and solids conveying is what happens in the first part of the screw, uh, and the first part of the extruder. So we have a hopper here where the material goes, and this material is gravity fed. In single screw extruders, we, we just pour the material in and we allow gravity to feed it, gravity to force it down onto the screw. The material is forced down onto the, um, the rotating screws there, um, normally in the form of pellets, most, most polymers um, most polymers are received from the manufacturers in the form of, of rounded pellets. But we could also use um, chips or granules or recycled material. Uh, not so much powders. Single screw extruders don't feed powders particularly well. So the material is fed down. It's pushed down by gravity onto the screws. The screws are rotating. And then what happens is, is what's called solids conveying. At the start of the process, we need the material to maintain in its solid form just for the first few um, few rotations of the screw. So we need it to maintain the solid form as it moves along the screw there. And this is because conveying in this region is via friction. It requires the friction between the polymer and the uh, surface of the barrel. It's a bit like um, a nut on a bolt. If you have a nut on a bolt and you, uh, you just twist the bolt, if you don't hold the nut, then the nut will just rotate with the bolt. It doesn't go anywhere. But we need a friction. We need some hold on the nut to make it travel up along the screw. And it's exactly the same here. If we don't have any friction at all, what will happen is the polymer will just spin around this region. It won't be taken away by the screw. So we need that friction. So the surface of the barrel in this region is normally fairly rough. Uh, and we need that friction to force the polymer along the length of the screw. So that's why we have to keep the material fairly cool. We don't want it to soften too much. We don't want it to melt in this region. If it melts, it will just stick to the screw and rotate around it. 
And anyone who's done research in polymer extrusion, all our PhD students find that the hard way. So they forget to switch this cooling on, they run the extruder, and after a while, the material stops coming out. And it's because the material's melted too early in this region and blocked the extruder. Then what's at the heart of the uh, extruder is the screw itself. And a, a simple extruder screw just has a single flight, which spirals all the way around the screw. Um, it's made out of one, one piece. It's machined from one piece of metal. And these are the different zones in the extruder screw. We have the feed zone, where we take these, um, the, the, the solid pellets. Then we have the compression zone, where this is gradually melted. And then the metering zone, where it's just fed to the die, so that the melted polymer is fed to the die to give us a nice, stable uh, flow with a constant pressure through the die. The melting in, this, um, in the screw is by two mechanisms. It's via conduction from the, um, from the barrel wall and from the screw itself, because the screw will heat up as well. Although we don't apply any heating to the screw, it will heat up. If it sits in a heated barrel, it will heat up. So we get conduction from the, the barrel and the screw. And we also get viscous shear, because the screw is rotating, the polymer is being smeared around in these gaps between the flights, and we get a mechanical shearing action, which, because of the viscosity of the polymer, acts to, to heat it up as well. Um, we've got an extruder screw here that I can pass around. Um, so as you can see, schematically, we've blown that up a bit there. So it, um, we, we, we've accentuated what actually happens in this region. The root of the screw in the compression region gets bigger. So the root of the screw gets bigger. So this gap between the screw and the, the, the barrel wall gets smaller. And that's what's giving the compression to the polymer and helping to melt it. When I pass the screw around and you have a look at it, you'll be able to see, I mean, it's, it, by, when you first look at it, you might not be able to see it, but if you look in detail, this region, the, the feed region, you can see is a deeper channel section, and it gradually um, is compressed in this region, and then it becomes constant again in this region. So you can kind of pick out the three distinct zones of the, of the extruder screw. So I'll pass this round. Please watch your fingers, because it is quite heavy. So you can have a look at that. So this is what happens in the melting region. So in that, in that small gap between the two flights there, between the flights and the barrier wall, there's a small rectangular gap there, which goes obviously right the way around the screw. This is what happens in this region. The melting is the critical um, kind of rate limiting step of extrusion. We need to melt the polymer efficiently. By the time it gets to the end of the screw, the polymer needs to be molten. If we've still got solid particles in there, the extrusion process doesn't work particularly well. And this is the mechanism by which the, the polymer melts. Because the, the barrel is hot and the screw is hot, the first material to melt, initially all the material will be packed, a solid bed packed together. It will, it will consist of pellets all packed together. The first part to melt will be the, um, a layer of film around the outside of this pack bed. Gradually, as we move further along the screw, more and more of this will melt and we'll get a bigger and bigger layer. And this starts to form at the back of this, this region as a pool, as a kind of pool of molten polymer, which starts to spiral around. And the idea is by the end of the screw, this pool gets bigger and bigger and bigger until it completely consumes the solid bed region. So the melting um, occurs before we get to the end of the uh, this extruder screw. And lots of people have done research on this, and we don't have time to go into research in, in really in, in much detail in this. Uh, lecture, but, but even back into the 1950s, people were unraveling the polymer from an extruder screw to work out the mechanisms of its mixing and using different coloured uh, dyes and, and trying to work out. And that, that's where the, the, the kind of mechanics and the, the mathematics of this, this melting mechanism first came from. And other people have done things like looked at uh, transparent extruders to watch what happens down the, the extruder screw length. We're not going to touch much on screw design, but this is a very important type of screw design, which is, which is widely used now in industry. So if you, if, you do, if you are involved in extrusion at all, you may come across this screw, which is slightly different to the one we're passing around. 
This is called a barrier screw and it's got an extra flight in it. Instead of just having a single flight down the length of the screw, it, the middle section has an additional flight. Um, and that has a slightly different pitch. So it starts at the back flight and it essentially uh, catches up to the front flight. And what that's trying to do is it's trying to force all the material from the solid bed, the, the solidified material, it's trying to force it to flow over a small gap into this molten region. So the height of the, of the barrier flight, this extra flight, is slightly lower. So the, poly so the polymer's got a little bit of a chance of, of separating, of, of flowing over the top of it there. And what this does, as this flight moves um, from this side to that side during the, the length of the, the screw, it forces all the solid material to flow over there and become molten. So it's a, it's a more effective melting type of screw. So this design was... Um, developed in the 1990s to improve melting and it's very widely used now as I say in industry. So that's called a barrier screw. Sorry? Sure. Um, so instead of just having a normal extruder would just be like this with one flight which goes the length of the screw like the one you're, you're looking at there. This type of screw in the middle section in the, the section that's trying to melt the material has an extra flight so it starts off there. It starts off just in front of, 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 of the, the normal flight, but the pitch is slightly different. So as we go into the next rotation, it moves a bit further forward because of its pitch, and then eventually it moves forward and, and it joins the flight in front. So if we look on this diagram, it starts there, and as, the, as it spirals around the extruder, it moves further to there. And as we saw before, the, the mechanism with this melt pool looks like this. So what this extra flight is doing is moving that way, but there's a small gap above it so polymer can pass over it. So it's essentially forcing all that solid polymer to be sheared in that small gap to, for, to go from the solid section to the, to the melt section. So that mechanism forces the polymer, by the, end of the, by the end of the screw, that flight's moved completely to that side. All that material doesn't have any choice. It must be in the, the molten state because that gap is very, very small. It can only pass through if it's molten. So it's, it's, it's forcing the polymer to be, to be, to be molten by the end of the, the, uh, the melting section of the screw. So it's much more effective. I can show you, we do have barrier screws. I can show you some in the labs if you, if you want to have a look in a bit more detail. Single, single screw extruders aren't very good mixers, and that's why twin screw extruders are used, and we'll talk about those in a moment. But we can have um, mixing elements on uh, single screws. Um, there's two types. One is distributive mixing, where we have some arrangement in the screw where the flow lines, the streamlines of the polymer, get rearranged many, many times. And this just improves the, um, the, the, the mixing by kind of continuous rearrangement. Um, so this is very good for things like colours. If we've added a coloured material into our polymer and we want it to be a very evenly distributed colour, this is a type of mixer that could be used. Another type is called dispersive mixing where we apply a high shearing stress. So these things are all, all uh, these mixers are all types that can be fitted onto the extruder screw. They can be machined into the extruder screw. So for example, a blister ring is a type of a dispersive mixing. So that's just a ring that all the polymers it's flowing down the screw has to pass through a small gap over the top of this ring between the ring and the barrel. So again, it's a way of forcing it, putting a high shearing stress on it, forcing it to flow over a small gap. And if there's any agglomerates in there, big particles of an additive, it breaks those down. This is a more advanced version of that. This is a spiral mixer. And again, it, it does the same job. It does a, a similar job to the barrier screw we just looked at. All the polymer flowing in these channels is forced to flow over a flight. So it's forced to make, make it flow over a, a high shear stress region. Onto the, the die design. So at the end of the extruder screw, once we've got our molten polymer and, it, and it's been pumped out continuously by the extruder screw, we need a die. The die forms the shape of the product. Um, it has to distribute, distribute the flow evenly. Um, we don't want any stagnation regions. The dies can be quite complex in shape uh, and they can be um, hollow. If, if we want to form hollow components like tubes and pipes, um, we can have an annular die. Uh, we can have a co-extrusion die if there's multiple layers. If there's more than one polymer in the product, we might need multiple layers. 
Um, so I'll talk about co-extrusion in a minute as well. So this is an example of a die whereby the extruder screw finishes there, the polymer's forced down here, but this is to form a pipe, so it's a, a hollow pipe section. And the way this is done is with um, what's called a torpedo. So there's a, there's a kind of torpedo shape there where the polymer has to flow around that shape and when it, then it comes out of the other side, it's in the form of an annulus, it's hollow. But to stop it collapsing back down, we have to add air into the middle of it. So we had a, a positive air pressure, which holds the outer surface of the, um, of the pipe open. And we can also have um, a, a vacuum bath as well. We, ha we can pass it through a calibration bath where we put a vacuum outside of it as well. So adding a positive pressure inside the tube and a vacuum on the outside to maintain the, um, the shape of the, the, the tube or the pipe. Um, there is in, in certain applications, um, but, but single screw extrusion, the, the extrusion process runs completely full and it's under high, quite high pressure. So generally air bubbles aren't, aren't a problem. Um, if we do have air bubbles entrained in the material, there are ways to vent. We can, we can have a vacuum and put a vent port on, uh, on the process, but that's more often done in twin screw extrusion, which, which is a mixing process, which I'll talk about in, in a minute. And the way this is done is the polymer comes out of an extruder, so it comes out from a normal extruder screw, and it goes through what's called a spiral mandrel die. So the polymer spirals round and round the inside of the die, then comes out as a very thin tube. It's then taken upwards, and it's inflated. So we put air inside the um, tube to inflate it, which adds orientation to the polymer, so it increases the uh, molecular orientation and the strength of the polymer, and also makes it thinner. So the, the dye to make this product is obviously quite, quite complex again. In terms of the sort of things that we need to monitor and control on the extruder, the basic things we set on a single screw extruder are obviously the temperature. So we can set the temperature, normally in different zones, we can set the temperature along the die. We set the screw rotation speed. And in a single screw extruder, the screw rotation speed governs the, the throughput, the volumetric throughput or the mass throughput. That's only governed. We, we can't control that independently. We just control screw speed, which, which, which then determines the throughput. Um, and the other things we can, we can control are the haul off speed, so how fast we pull off the, the product at the end. In terms of the, thing we can, the, the parameters we can monitor on the extruder, well, the typical parameters that the extruder manufacturers supply us with are, are quite limited. We're normally able to monitor the pressure inside the die, and this is good for a kind of quality control measurement, so we want the pressure to be nice and stable. If the pressure drops off, we know there's some issue, the, the material's not feeding properly, or if we know the pressure goes up too high, maybe there's a blockage or the material's changed. Um, we can monitor melt temperature, but melt temperature is actually quite difficult to monitor, so we normally monitor the, the temperature of the, the die rather than the polymer. And we can maybe monitor something like the, the motor current or the motor torque. So the amount, of, um, the amount of energy, the amount of torque we have, to put, we have to give to the screw to make it turn continuously. So this gives an indication of any, it's quite sensitive to, to changes in the process. So if a heater band breaks down or the material changes, then we should be able to detect that in, in the head pressure or the, the motor current. Depending on the products we're making, we might need to um, to uh, monitor things like dimensions. So if we're making a medical tubing, if it's very high precision, we might need to measure the outer diameter or the thickness of the tubing. Um, we might want to monitor color, if the color is very important for our application, or even surface finish. So we might have some method where a light is, is shone at some incidental angle to the, the surface and we can, we can monitor the, um, the surface finish. At Bradford, one of our research strengths is process monitoring. So we do a lot of work in, in more advanced uh, process monitoring uh, techniques, but we don't really have time to, to go into them today. But we, we measure the rheology, the flow behavior of materials in process. We use ultrasonics. We use spectroscopy to get chemical information of the polymers as well. But these aren't typically done during the extrusion process in, in industry. Um, sometimes our products, our extruded products, need to have more than one layer. So we have to use a process called co-extrusion. 
Um, so lots of packaging materials, even very simple materials like um, your bread packaging. If you buy a, a loaf of bread, then the, the, the plastic material that it comes in has multiple layers. Um, so it can consist of five layers. Normally the layer in the middle is a barrier layer that stops oxygen passing because we don't want the food to go off. The layer on the outside is a cheap material, a commodity thermoplastic polymer because obviously we don't want it to cost too much. And then sometimes we have to have an adhesive layer that bonds these two together. So if they don't uh, bond together very well, we have to have an extra layer bonding them together. Other reasons we might want to have co-extrusion are maybe to use recycled material. Maybe the recycled material has, isn't perfect, the colour isn't, isn't, isn't great, or maybe we have small particles in it, but we can use that for the bulk of our product. But on the top layer, we want it to look very good, so we have a, we have a layer of virgin material on the top. Um, maybe we want to have foam in the inside of our process. We can add foaming agent to produce bubbles and a foam material inside the process and then to have um, a, a, an unfoamed layer on the, on the outside. So it doesn't look like a foam material but it's more lightweight. So many applications in building where we have um, plastic cladding on the outside of buildings that's foamed on the inside but, but not foamed uh, on, on the outside. So this is what a co-extrusion process looks like on plants. As you can see, all these are different extruders which feed one gigantic die. So this is a, a, a really big version of the spiral mandrel die. So this is a seven layer film blowing process with four different extruders, so four separate polymers. So each polymeric layer comes from a different extruder. And these all have to join up inside the die, spiral around, and then form this, this shape. So you can imagine the complexity of A, making this equipment, that, that die will cost, you know, many, many tens of thousands of pounds, but also in setting it up, in designing it, in optimizing it, and setting it up with different polymers. So everything we looked at so far has been single screw extrusion. So single screw extrusion is a process to form products by continuously melting, pumping the product through a die, and forming a shape. Another very important type of extrusion is twin screw extrusion, which is a mixing process. So twin screw extrusion is also called compounding. So you might, you, might hear, you might be aware of it as compounding. But essentially here we use two screws, two intermeshing screws, which co-rotate. Um, and this is a very, very effective mixing process, much more effective than a, than a single screw extruder. So most polymeric materials at some point in their lives have been through a twin screw extrusion process. So it's a very, very widely used process although the, the material that comes at the end of this is an intermediate material. It doesn't form a product. We just form pellets, which we then use in another process. So one of the reasons this is uh, very widely used is it, it's uh, forced conveying. We don't rely on friction, so we can put any materials in a twin screw extruder we like. We can put liquids in, we can put powders in. They don't have any choice. They're taken away by the co-rotating screws. We can have multiple feedstock materials. We can feed more than one material in, and I'll show you some, ex some examples of that. We can run a very, very high screw rotation speeds and therefore give very low resonance time. So the polymer comes into the screws. These might be rotating at 2,000 revs per minute. They're mixed and out to the other end in maybe seconds, maybe 15 seconds. So the... Um, the, 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 high, the time that the polymer experiences at high temperature is, is, very, um, is very low, which is good for the polymer. Twin screw extruder screws are modular, so they fit onto a central shaft and we build them up out of lots of different elements. So we can tailor the elements of a twin screw extruder to give as much or as little mixing as we want. So they're very um, flexible devices. So for example, um, conveying elements, these don't do a great deal of mixing, they just convey the polymer along. Um, and if we want to, we can change the pitch of these to build pressure up. So if we're having a mixing region coming after here, we can build up the pressure to force them into a mixing region. 
The other types of elements that I use are these kneading blocks. So the kneading blocks are what give the, um, the extruder its, its mixing. So these put a lot of mechanical en energy into the uh, system. And we can change the angles of these kneading elements to, uh, to change the amount of mixing we put in. Um, and we can change the width of these angles as well. So we have very narrow, narrow width of these kneading elements. We have distributive mixing, so we realign the flow. If we have very wide paddles, we have dispersive mixing where we, we form high shearing forces to break up the particles. And I've actually got a, a, a pair of twin screw extruder screws, which I'll pass around. So these, um, these are for a, uh, a kind of medium scale extruder, 24 millimeter diameter screws. And when you look at them, you'll be able to see these different elements. So you can see they mainly consist of conveying elements, um, but they also have mixing sections where they have these needing, needing uh, blocks. And you can see the different angles of the kneading blocks. If the kneading uh, elements are, have quite a shallow angle, if they're 30 degrees apart, then it doesn't provide a great deal of mixing. If they're at 90 degrees to each other, then it provides the maximum levels of mixing. And if you get the screws right, you should be able to put them on the desk next to each other and roll them along. And they should intermesh perfectly so you can see the, the actual mechanism of the, of the screws. So if you want to pass those along and try, and try and keep them together. So this figure gives us a, a kind of a typical setup of a twin screw extrusion screw because as I say we can, we can configure the elements in you know, an infinite number of ways. It's like a jigsaw, we can configure them in any way we like. So these are the, um, the mixing paddles and these are the feeding elements. So a typical twin screw extruder would have a few mixing zones. It would have mainly conveying which are the green zones and then a metering section at the end but it would have several mixing sections which are these. Um, it can have different ports, so we can feed the materials in, not just at the start of the extruder barrel, but we can feed them part way through as well. If we wanted to add an additive quite near the end, just before this last mixing zone, if it was a very sensitive additive that didn't like being at high temperature, like an active ingredient, like a drug, then maybe we could add it quite near to the end, so we would only see a very short amount of time in the system. And these charts just show what would happen if Instead of having three mixing sections like that diagram, we just had one or two or three, and, we, and it compares them. So it, this is comparing the level of fill. So extruder, twin screw extruders um, don't run full. A single screw extruder runs completely full. So all the volume between the screw and the barrel is completely filled with polymer. Twin screw extruders don't run like that. We have to starve feed them, which means we have to trickle the feed of the material into them. Um, and the, the, um, the gaps between the screws and the barrel are, are only partially filled. And that degree of fill will depend on the throughput, how fast we feed the polymers in, and also the screw rotation speed, but also the geometry of how we've set the screw up. So if we just had one mixing zone, we might see the degree of fill be relatively low through most of it, and then we get to the, um, the mixing section, it will be a lot highly filled, and then we get to the end of the screw through the metering section, it will be highly filled again. So it might have an average typical fill of about 30%, an average residence time of maybe 60 seconds. If we move down to a screw with three mixing sections, then we might go up to, exam for example, 60% fill. Um, and this will increase the residence time. So we'll have more mixing, but the polymer will spend more time uh, within the screw. So the mixing time might be 120 seconds. So basically for a p any particular application, you tailor the process, you tailor the screws to, to, do, you know, to suit the actual application, the materials you want to mix. Um, right, so now we're going to talk a little bit about micro-extrusion, so which is the main focus of this talk, and it, but it really follows on from, from what we're talking about so far. So the fundamentals of larger scale extrusion hold also for micro-extrusion. There's no difference really in the process. It's just a scaled down version of the larger extrusion. But there is an increase in need for smaller scale extrusion. 
So for example, in medical applications, medical tubing and, and medical implants, for electronics and optoelectronics applications, um, for uh, things like fibers, obviously very fi extruded fibers can be very small diameter. So as I said, the technology is really just scaled down version from the large extruders. Um, screw diameters from a single screw, the, the single screw that we passed around was uh, 38 millimeters, so it's kind of medium laboratory scale extruder. Single screw extruders can go down to about 11 or 12 millimeter screw diameter, so they, they, they get quite small. If the screw diameter drops lower than about that, um, that sort of size, then we can't feed pellets anymore because the pellets have to fit into the gaps between the flights. If the screws get very, very small, we can only feed powdered materials. So that's one limitation. So most small scale extruders, about 12 millimeters is about the smallest we get to, although there are some very specialist ones smaller than that, but they're for powder feed only. So just a couple of examples of some of the, um, the things we've, we've worked on, some of the materials. You're going to see in the demonstration, you're going to see one of these extruders working. So this is a, a relatively small scale Dr. Collin laboratory single screw extruder. This, in this case, was producing a tube um, from um, a, a PLA-based, polylactide-based polymer. So this is the haul-off system. So this is the... Um, the the, the vacuum bath and then the, the takeoff, the, the winders and the, the caterpillar at the end. This is an example of where we've used a special die which has a serrated surface. And this was for a medical application where a company wanted a medical tubing that could be inserted into the body with a very low coefficient of friction. So one of the things they asked us to do was to look at different geometries of die which added a surface roughness onto the, the outer surface of the product to um, to uh, reduce that coefficient of friction, to, to, to enhance the, the kind of um, sliding of the, of the, of the uh, tube into the body. This is another example um, of, of one of our projects, and this was to produce um, micro, porous micro pellets. And this was for another medical application where these pellets were going to be used inside the body. Um, and I can't give you any details about this because it was a confidential piece of work, but there were, it was a highly filled material, so it had a very high percentage of non-polymeric material in there. And you can see from these um, SEM images, the size of these uh, are very small. That's one millimeter scale. So the, the diameter of these was a few hundred microns. So very small scale, but you can see the integrity of the, the tube shape there. So we made a continuous tube and then we had to pass, pass these through a pelletizer, which chopped the tube, cut it into these lengths. This is another example. I'm not sure how, uh, how well you can see this from the, uh, from the SEM image there. This was a complex shape, which consisted of four different components. And these extruded components locked together. And the idea of this was for uh, a medical device, so we could individually um, we could pull on one of these, these, quarter, these quartiles of the, of the extruded material when it was locked together, and it would cause the material to flex. So the idea was that a surgeon would be able to use it and tailor the direction of the tube, which was carrying the, the wires and whatever devices he, he, he used. So it's not so much a micro component, but the features on it are quite micro scale. We also get very small scale twin screw extruders. So we've got several of these in our laboratory. So these are, this is an 11 millimeter twin screw extruder, uh, another 12 millimeter twin screw extruder, just for small batches of mixing, small batches of compounding. We also have um, this type of extruder, which is a conical twin screw extruder for very small batches. So the volume of polymer that's held here is, is in the order of, um, well, it can, we can use masses of, uh, maybe 10 grams of polymer, so we can work with very, very small batches if the, the material is very expensive or in short supply. And these can be run either in a single pass, where the polymer just passes through the screws once, or in a recirculating channel, where it comes down and, and it's passed backwards through the screws several times. So if we want to do a certain amount of mixing, we can, we can achieve that. Um, another big area for, uh, for twin screw extrusion on a very small scale is for pharmaceutical materials. 
we're increasingly looking at pharmaceutical materials and we've got quite a big uh, research group within our, our labs um, where we engineers, polymer engineers, liaise with pharmaceutical scientists. And here what we're trying to do is to um, enhance the properties of poorly soluble drugs. So drugs that if we just take them in a tablet, they don't really get into our system. They don't pass into our system. So one of the ways to improve that solubility is to freeze the drugs in their amorphous form inside a, a polymer matrix. And extrusion is one way to do this. So we add both the drug and the polymer into the extruder. We mix them. We cool them down. We can't cool them in a water bath here because they're soluble polymers generally. We chop them up into pellets, mill them into powders, and then form tablets with them. So what we're trying to do is to mix the crystalline drug into uh, the polymeric material and form either a dispersion of the drug particles or even better, a solution where the drug particles dissolve within the polymer in their amorphous form. So this is a big area now for, um, for, for the pharmaceutical industry and most of the major pharma companies have got products on the market now which are made using extrusion. So this is quite a big area. But again, it's small scale because the, the pharmaceutical materials, the drugs are, are very expensive in short supply. Okay, so the last thing I'm going to talk about now is dye drawing. So it's a completely separate process to extrusion. Um, and this is essentially a process, it's a solid phase orientation process. So we don't involve the melts now, we're not melting the polymer. We heat the polymer up in this case above its glass transition temperature, but below its melting temperature. So it's that window above glass transition but below melting because we don't want the polymer to melt, but we want it to, to soften slightly. And then it's basically pulled through a die. And what this does is, is increases the molecular orientation. In this drawn section there, it increases molecular orientation, which improves the strength and stiffness of the material. Um, oh, it just reminds me, I've got uh, a selection of, of micro-extruded tubes uh, here for you to have a look at these samples. Some of these are quite, uh, if you look at the, the ends of them, some of them are quite uh, intricate in shapes. They have, um, they, they have the, some of them are cannula and they have several, um, several holes that run through them. So just have a quick look at those. So the die drawing process basically looks something like this. We start with a polymer, which we have to heat up, as I say, above glass transition. Then we have a die, so the green section is the metal die, which has got some sort of uh, convergence angle. And we have to apply a load on it, we have to pull the polymer through. The change in cross-sectional area gives us our draw ratio, which we can, we can measure the amount of orientation. Draw ratio is just the um, ratio of the initial divided by the final area. Um, so we either have the drawing which is controlled by the die in this region or we have free drawing as it exits the die. So the diameter still continues to reduce a little bit down there. So what this does, it, it, if we think about the polymeric chains, it aligns the chains in the same direction. So it improves greatly the strength and the stiffness of the chains going in the, the draw direction. So for example, this is, the, um, this is a square cross-section material during die drawing. So this is the start of it. When we first start it, we've got to machine that shape onto a, onto a billet, which is that diameter or that, that um, cross section. And then we pull it through the die and gradually all the material will take that, that sort of shape. So it, it's, it's a, a continuous process. So I'll pass that around, you can have a look at it. So that's the start material is the, the large section. And then you can see where it goes through the die and into the small section. These are some more examples as well. I'll pass, I'll pass these around. Um, this is a really good example of a material before and after drawing. So one of these materials, which are similar diameter, these are polypropylene bars. One of them has been extruded. The extruded one is the one you can bend quite easily. The one that's been die drawn, you can feel the difference. It's very, very stiff. You, you can't bend it. So that's a good, a good example. Another good example is this pipe. So the thick pipe on one side is the material before die drawing. Then as it's been drawn, we can see where it goes transparent because of the, um, the, the, the strains involved. Uh, it gets much, much stiffer. So it's another good example of different geometry. So that's a rod geometry. This one's 
obviously a tube, and that one was a square geometry. No, it's all pulled from, from the front, yes. So again, you're going to see a demonstration of this done at a, a small scale in the, in the labs now. So this is some of the equipment that we do our die drawing on on, on slightly larger scale. So we have a big motor which is connected to this chain which pulls the material through. This is the oven where the, uh, the, heat, the material is heated up to a temperature where we can draw it. Um, that just shows it exiting the die there. So it's clamped on high force to, to a motor. The motor connects to a chain and pulls the material through the die. So just to kind of exemplify this, we've got a few applications of die drawing in just the last couple of minutes before we finish. Um, the first one was really a, a wood replacement material. And this was a project that was done at Bradford with um, Dow. And then Dow took this technology on and spun it out in the US and developed a company based on this. Um, and what the aim of this work was to do was to produce a, a, a wood replacement material using die drawing. So uh, they were using a polymer. Um, so they went through the die drawing process where they oriented the polymer. But the clever part of it was that the polymer had not only polymer chains in it, it had mineral particles. So it had particles of, of non-polymeric material. Um, and as the polymer chains align through the, uh, the dye, what the guys here at Bradford found during this, this research was that the, um, the, um, the, where the particles formed, there was cavitation around them. So what it meant was that the uh, density of the material after dye drawing, we had an in increase in properties and stiffness and strength, but we also had a big reduction in density. And one of the problems with trying to make a wood replacement ma material out of polymers is that polymers are higher density, so they're much, much heavier than their, their wood materials. But because this was a, uh, because of this cavitation, because of the air gaps around the, the mineral filler, um, it produced a, a low density material with very, very similar properties to, to wood. So the, the company produced this by die drawing. They then embossed it, so they put, it through, put this material through rollers to form a kind of a wood pattern. So this is a, an example of one of their products. So you can see the, the embossed pattern on it. And you can also see the kind of fibrous nature. It kind of feels like wood. Oh, this is, this is polymer with a mineral filler. You can actually see that it, it, it kind of looks and feels like wood. And, and the good thing about it is you can screw into this, you can nail into it, so it has very, very similar properties and workability to, to wood. These are some of the applications of that material, again, from that company's website, from the Ovation's website, um, you know, decking and fencing material and um, uh, you know, furnishing pallets. Moving down to the smaller scale, again, our focus is micro. So micro die drawing, small scale die drawing. This is normally done rather than using a big motor pulling the parts through on a chain, we use a tensometer. So we use a tensile test machine to pull the um, polymeric material through the die. So you're going to see, this is the example that you're going to see. You're going to see um, some small scale die drawing on a tensometer in a minute when I finish. This is one uh, example where we worked with um, a company who were trying to produce an arterial stent. Um, so it's a stent which is implanted in the body to, um, to, you know, to hold the walls of, of an artery um, open. But it's, it's resorbable. So the idea is it, um, it dissolves back into the body after a period of time, maybe six months. But to get the sufficient properties, to get the mechanical properties of the stent, it couldn't just be produced by extrusion. We had to have this die drawing process to increase the properties. So this is the die drawing happening. This is the starter material. We have to kind of make a tag on the end of it before we force it through the, the die. This is it actually coming up through the die. That's the, the grips of the tensile machine holding onto the tube. This is all done heated inside an oven. And this is the final product. So the company take that die drawing material they have it laser cut uh, into a, a shape of a stent, and then that stent, they can then be crimped, implanted into the body, then expanded on a balloon to, to fill up the artery. And then they've done kind of um, in vivo tests in, in, in pigs and things to prove this technology. So that's all done using technology developed at Bradford using the, uh, the, the die drawing process. <coughs> 
Uh, another application of, of small-scale dye drawing is to produce a material, again it's a medical application, to produce a material that reverts. Once we dye draw the material, we change its, its geometry, if we heat it up to around its glass transition temperature, it reverts back to the shape it was before. But we can use this to our benefit for things, um, for, for things like um, bone anchors. So if we're trying to attach a material into a, a drilled hole inside a bone, if we use a dye drawn material, which reverts, it goes back to its former shape and it fills the, the hole inside the bone. So there's a lot of research going on um, at Bradford with, with colleagues working on several projects related to this area, related to shape memory and medical devices. So this is one example of, a, of a, the, the, um, the type of uh, sample we might want to do, and this is to hold a, a suture in place. So these grooves there are for the, uh, of, of the suture to, to fit in, and after heating, it reverts back to, to a completely different shape. So this is the oriented and recovered material. And we've got an image there showing several steps during, during the reversion. So at temperature around TG, reverting back to its original shape before it was drawn. And just one final application, again, going back to pharmaceutical applications and drug delivery, we've looked at how we can tailor the release of drugs by adding orientation into the polymer. So one of the projects we've had was, was using um, rods, like the, the didron rods you were looking at before, but instead of being made from polypropylene, they were made from polylactide, which is um, a, a bioresorbable material that can go inside the body, loaded with a drug drawn to different draw levels, and we found that the different draw levels, we, by, by, by imparting different draw levels, we could influence the rate of drug release quite significantly. So this is um, releasing paracetamol, out over a number of uh, weeks in the dissolution test into the release medium. And what we found was that when we looked at cross sections of these highly oriented rods, we found there were, there were channels set up. So there were channels which allowed the, the drug and the, the, um, the dissolution media to get in and, and to, um, to start allowing the drug to release. So it's similar to this mechanism that the drug finds it easier. If the, poly if the polymer chains are very highly oriented, the drug finds it easier to to kind of run along this direction. So it's more easy to, to elute from the ends of the, the drawn rods than from, from the sides. So it's a kind of run and jump mechanism. Right, I'm pretty much out of time. So just to finish off, three take home messages from today. Single screw extrusion is a continuous process, a manufacturing process for producing any products that can be made with a constant cross section, such as pipes and tubes and sheets. Twin screw extrusion or compounding is a mixing process that normally uses um, two linear or can use conical screws, but this is a very good process for very intimate mixing of polymers, but it doesn't produce a final product. It, it's an intermediate step to go into another process. And die drawing is a solid phase orientation process. So you're going to see die drawing and single screw extrusion on small scale now in the labs in the next, next couple of hours. So thanks very much for your attention. I hope you found some of this interesting and hope you managed to take something away from it. And uh, if you have any questions, I'll be around in the, in the, the demos as well. So feel free to, to ask me more, more then. Okay, thank you.